Um, all right, so thank you guys for join, joining Washoe County Library System's virtual program, The Mysterious Bats of the Lake Tahoe Basin. And thank you so much, um, Sarah, for um, doing your program uh, virtually. It's pretty awesome. Um, Sarah is with the Tahoe Institute of Natural Science, and I'll let her give more of a little bio if she wants at the beginning. Um, one thing, just to let you guys know, I did mute everyone. If you have a question, feel free to um, type it in the chat box and Sarah and I will, well, I will go ahead and um, take a look at that chat and um, ask her any of the questions you guys have. All right, um, and if you want, you can introduce yourselves um, in the chat box too and we get to know you guys. All right, so Sarah, go ahead and take it away. Perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Hawkinsmith. I'm the Outreach Director from the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. So a few of you might be wondering, who is the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science? We are a nonprofit organization that loves nature and we love animals, especially in the Tahoe Basin. And we wanna connect youth and adults to nature via research, education, and outreach. So one of uh, the three pillars that we have is education. So I see kids here, which makes me feel even more comfortable. Um, we provide field trips and we go into school to teach kids about all the local bats and birds, insects, mammals, geology, flowers, and so on. And as we do so, um, we, we, we engage kids in actually place-based education. So learning about their local flora and fauna instead of just opening a textbook. We also conduct research, scientific research. This is my boss, Dr. Will Richardson, and he collects data. And then we take the kids out there to learn science uh, while we're collecting data. Um, I've created a local, the local bird club at the elementary school. So kids are bird watching before school. Um, and again, we have hands-on um, outdoor education for children. Um, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, we have created online learning as well. If you have questions, I can provide that at, at the end. Um, the outreach portion of our institute is something that I'm in charge of. Um, I lead nature walks for all uh, public kids to adults. Um, we collect data. So if you're interested in collecting information about science, you could come out with me. We can uh, collect information on bald eagles and butterflies, falcons, so on. Um, I lead uh, wildflower hikes, lectures, and uh, lots of different outings. So tomorrow I have a bird walk at the Village Green in Incline Village. It's full, but we'll be having a lot of presentations and outings in the future. Here's some pictures of our outings. We do it year round. And lastly, our institute is based on hard science. So we are one of the main researchers in the area. Um, we collect uh, data on hummingbirds, willow flycatcher, swinks and thrush, uh, lagomorphs such as rabbits and bunnies, and uh, we are looking to understand our populations here in the Tahoe region a little bit more. But enough about about tins for now, and let's go into our topic, which is going to be all dark. This is about mysterious bats, and the reason why I came up with this presentation to begin with is because bats are so misunderstood and shamed a lot because people are scared of them. So I guess my first question is, is anybody a little scared of bats? And if they are, please raise your hand. Or you can, okay, you're a little scared of bats, right on. Also, if you're a little scared, you can also write in your chat box as well. Cool. I also have a couple other questions um, before we get into the hard science. Um, I'll try to cater to kids and adults with this program. I originally thought it was going to be all adults, but I'll try my best to cater to kids as well. Um, my first question is how many bat species, so different kinds of bats, are there in the world? So you can type this in the chat box and Amanda can read it off to me. You're muted, Amanda. 100. Good guess. 500,000 or 50,000, 123. Right, well, there's a, probably over this number, but around 1,200 different species of bat on the planet. And um, there's about a little over 4,000 different uh, species of mammals. And so bats make a quarter of all mammals. So there's a lot of bats on the planet. Here's another question. 
How many bats do you think live in the United States? We have 1,200, give or take a few, um, around the world. How many do we have in the United States? What are we seeing, Amanda? Nothing yet. You can type this number in the chat box. 20 million. Great answer. 50. <laughs> nice. Actually, 50 is an excellent answer. We have 47, give or take, bat species um, in, the, in the United States. And I guess the last question that I have until we get into the hard presentation is, um, what state does not have bats? So you think of all our 50 states, can you think of a, a state that might not have bats? Oh, someone said Alaska. Two people said Hawaii. Cool. Well, actually, they all have bats. I just wanted to see the participation. So <laughs> very good job. I would have guessed maybe Alaska, Hawaii, or Hawaii if I didn't know as well. So um, there are a lot of misconceptions about our bat friends. And throughout the presentation, I'm going to be speaking most of the time. So if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box. And then um, if I want some engagement, we can vote by, if you think something's false, you can put your thumb down. And if you think something's uh, true, you can put your thumb up. So my first question is, true or false? Bats are flying mice. Some false, false. Most people are saying false. Okay, so it looks like we lost Sarah. We'll have to get her back in here. <laughs> no idea what just hey, happened, but there she Hello. is. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna share screen and hop back on. I apologize to anybody that um, just had me log off for a moment. That has never happened before, but um, we're just gonna continue with that diversity, okay? So, here is a species. Um, it's the smallest species on the planet. This is the kitty hog nose bat. Um, it's located in uh, Thailand, in the northern parts of Thailand. It is so small that it, is, it weighs less than a penny. So the species of uh, the smallest bird that we have in the Tahoe region is the Calliope hummingbird. And this kitty uh, hog nose bat is much smaller than that. So, um, bats are very diverse. They can be very small and they can be very large. And I'll show you the largest bat that we have. This is our flying fox. So obviously we don't have flying fox in Tahoe because that would be really, really cool. But these are more for tropical locations. The, the flying fox is um, a group of, of, of bats um, that have a very long wingspan. So some flying foxes can have a wingspan up to six feet. So that's probably taller than most females. Imagine having a wingspan that, that long. Um, but typically when a bat is much larger, it is a fruit bat, meaning that it eats mostly fruits and is possibly a pollinator. So here's our black flying fox, the, lo the, the largest out of all flying fo foxes that live in Australia. And what's really important about the, the black flying flying fox and flying foxes in general are, um, they go from tree to tree and they eat tons of seeds. And when they do so, they eventually go to the bathroom and those seeds are dispersed in other areas because they can fly from one tree to the next. So they are one of the reasons why trees are planted all over the tropical forest and also why a lot of plants are pollinated, which we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but I really wanted to talk about bat diversity around the world. So um, one of another animal that uh, is curious to people or is interesting to people is the um, common vampire bat. So out of the over 1,200 different species of bats on the planet, only a couple different species actually consume blood. Most bats are insectivores, meaning they eat insects, and other bats are fruit eaters. So here's a couple interesting facts about the common vampire bat. And the main thing is they do not actually suck blood. Okay, so for kids, if you're scared of vampire bats, you shouldn't be too scared of vampire bats because they don't live here in Tahoe at all. They live in Central and South America. And basically what they do is they use echolocation to find their food. 
And all different bats have different um, techniques with their echolocation. Some are much stronger and they're able to hear well um, or they're able to produce certain sounds to find their environment. But some don't use it as much. And vampires actually spend a lot of the time on the ground. Uh, they can crawl and they can even run. And um, when they do so, they find an animal. So one of their main food sources in Central and South America are farm animals. So cows and chickens and sheep and pigs, that's their target food source. Um, so they, what they do is they crawl on the ground slowly and they use heat sensors in their nose. So in their funny looking nose right here, they have something that draws them to where blood is pumping um, strongly or is very warm and near the skin. So when those bats find an animal that has like a vein that's easy to access, um, with their sharpest teeth in the animal kingdom, they make a tiny, tiny little cut. So it's not like what you think a vampire would do. They don't latch on, they just make a tiny incision somewhere where the blood would flow. And in their saliva, they actually have a local anesthetic. So the animals can't even feel it, doesn't hurt the animals at all um, in terms of feeling. And then they also have a blood thinner, so like an aspirin or something in their saliva that allows them to um, uh, have that blood keep pumping. So it's producing enough blood to feed that specific vampire bat. Um, a vampire bat probably only has a couple tablespoons of blood in one night and will only take that much from one animal. But what I find really interesting about the vampire bat is they're unlike any animal in the animal kingdom and they actually enjoy um, being around other bats that aren't in their family. So in the animal kingdom, there's packs of wolves that they're their, their, their families are, um, there's mothers and fathers that are uh, animals that protect their young. Well, uh, vampire bats uh, show reciprocal altruism, meaning that even if it's not in their family and there's, a, there's a, a bat that is nearby or in their colony that is um, not getting enough nutrition, a bat that's totally unrelated to that bat that needs help will go and feed that bat and regurgitate food so that bat is able to survive. So it's, they have friendships, they even hug, which is very, very uncommon for the animal kingdom, especially if you know a lot about the animal kingdom. So vampire bats are actually very interesting and um, uh, have a lot of really cool facts about them. So I have another question for you. Do you guys know, what is the age of the oldest known bat that we know of? I want some, I want you to type this in the chat box and then Amanda will read some answers off to me. Oh, okay, 45, 20, 52, ooh, 150. Another one says 50, 74, 23. Cool. Great guess. Seven. Well, I will let you know. Um, we have, so most people will guess that since bats are really small, most bat species are very tiny. Um, people think they might only live like five to eight years um, or maybe even one to two years if they're similar to a rodent. But um, there are some cases um, where bats live a lot longer than most people think, but you guys actually have some really good guesses. So this Brant's bat is a species that lives in Asia, in Europe, and um, uh, in Siberia. So they can live in very, very cold areas and they can hibernate in those cold areas as well. But there was a bat that was found, um, let me make sure I have my date right, was found in 1964 and was banded. So it was, um, it, got a, it had a number put on him. And then he was detected again in 2005. So he was at least 41 years old. So they don't know when this bat was born. So they couldn't tell how old it was when they first found it. But at least this bat was 41 years old, which is very, very young. Uh, I'm sorry, very, very old for what you would consider a very small animal. So um, brought, uh, this branch bat is an indicator that we have so much to learn about bats and how, how old they can be. And um, because of their metabolism and the way that they go into dormancies or hibernation, humans also can learn a lot about um, bats in general as well. Perfect. 
So here is um, our next bat, and this is the lesser long nose bat. So this is a question for adults. Um, does anybody enjoy a margarita? You can give me a handshake if you enjoy a margarita, if you like tequila. Okay, so many bats are pollinators, um, meaning that they go from one flower to the next, and they stick their nose into that flower, and they can consume nectar. And when they do so, they get pollen on their face, and then they go to the next flower and mix up the pollen, and then eventually help that flower produce seeds, which makes more plants, right? So the lesser long-nosed bat is um, a species that pollinates flowers or cacti or succulents that the flowers come out at night, okay? So they are nocturnal, but also these flowers come out in the evening time as well. And the specific um, bat, uh, plants that they're pollinating include agave species, uh, saguaro, and organ pipes. So um, if we didn't have bats, pollinating agave, then we wouldn't have tequila. Now, there is a little bit of a contradiction there where a lot of the tequila farmers are um, using clones of their agave and they're not actually allowing their agave to flower. And so it is an issue with um, bats being attracted to an area, hoping that that will be um, a, 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 a succulent or a cacti that will eventually flower. However, it won't because it's just a clone and then they stop it from when it's actually going to flower. So there is a tequila inter interchange project that is educating farmers on um, bats and uh, um, having them or suggesting that they have part of their plants um, flower before um, cutting them down. So um, that's a something to look into if you're a, a connoisseur is tequila that has been uh, adapted as bat friendly and um, within the tequila interchange project. So again, here's a good look at how much pollen can actually be on a bat's face as it goes into a flower. So something that I thought was inter interesting before we get into um, Tahoe's bats um, is that some bats can actually fish for um, fish. So some bats drink blood, right? So they don't suck blood, but they consume blood. Some bats eat insects, some bats are pollinators, um, some bats eat fruit, but some bats fly. So I actually have a video for you, about 20 seconds, um, that I wanted to show you. Fishing bats use echolocation to direct them. The sense of sound can guide them so well that they can hear fish surfacing in a pond. Use that sound plus echolocation to time their dives to the exact moment a fish rises close enough to the surface. In an impressive display of timing and weight agility, the bat skims the water, picking off fish with its long legs and claws. I just wanted to show that I thought it was really cool uh, that bats can um, can catch fish while they're while they're flying around. So, um, but next we're going to get into Tahoe's bat diversity, and I have another question for you that you can put in the chat box, and that is how many different species of bats? So we have 47 in the United States. How many live in Tahoe or the Tahoe region? 15. Five, twelve, twelve, seven, eleven. Great guesses. I mean, I'm I'm surprised by how most of you are very accurate with your answers. Typically, I get much different answers. So good job, bat crowd. I, I think you guys know actually a lot about bats. Um, there are sixteen different species that are, have been. Um, uh, confirmed in the Tahoe region, whether if it's acoustics or the sound that they make, or if they're caught in a mist net, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So one of uh, my favorite Tahoe bats that we have is called the Townsend's Big-Eared Bat. And the Townsend's Big-Eared Bat has these really big, um, long ears um, that help them echolocate, meaning they produce a sound, it bounces back, and they're able to hear 
um, their prey and find it at night. Um, and the Townsends figured that it, when it goes to roost and sleep, whether it's hibernating or going through a dormancy period or just sleeping during the day, it'll actually roll its ears, kind of look like horns, um, down so it can retain heat, which I think is very interesting. Um, and when they fly, instead of having their, um, their ears flop in the wind, they point them forward so they're aerodynamic as they fly, so it's not a drag as they're flying in the air. Um, but what's interesting about the Townsend's big-eared bat is that it lives in, it does very well living in caves and mines. So um, when we had um, all the mining occur in, in Nevada, there's, oh, there's between 100 and 200 thousand mines just in Nevada alone and as people were mining for silver and all the different metals um bats started to move in uh the only thing that's different about the Townsend figure bat is they're very very vulnerable to disturbance so um once these mines were abandoned but people started to come in and recreate in these mines and, and caves it would disturb these bats and they would fly out and, and waste their energy now um, after mining was, was finished, um, the Bureau of Land Management and, and um, the Nevada, I think it's Department of Minerals, um, they, they closed down and hard closed a lot of these um, mines because people kept getting in there. There's uh, 15 or so deaths um, from people suffocating and all these different things. So they hard closed um, a lot of these mines. Now, researchers realized like, oh, this probably isn't a great idea because um, there's most likely a lot of bats in these mines. So now they've come up with a system before a mine is hard closed and sealed off, they'll send out ne Nevada Department of Wildlife Biologists to do surveys for up to two years. And as they're doing that, um, they'll look for any evidence of bats or if bats roost there, or if there's any guano, meaning bat, um, um, uh, feces or bat poop. Um, so they'll look for that. And um, if it, it, that is detected, then they've come up with these really cool metal features where bats can travel in and out, but humans can't go in. So that's a way that uh, some conservation measures towards bats in the area. And I forgot to mention that all Tahoe species, um, all bats in the Tahoe region are insectivores, meaning they only eat insects. We do not have a uh, pollinating bats or fruit bats in our region. Another bat that we have is our Townsend's uh, or our silver-haired bat. And what I find very interesting about bats in general is um, not only are they pretty funny looking, I think they're really cute. Um, this one kind of reminds me of Haggard from Harry Potter. But they have interesting uh, reproduction. Uh, reproduction. So, Let's make this as kid friendly as possible. Um, so basically, bats will, um, they have to, most bats will go through a, a dormancy or a hibernation uh, period where they need to sleep for a long time. So bats are actually looking for a mate in the fall or many bats, especially the bats here in Tahoe, are looking for a, bat, uh, a mate in the fall. So on their way down, if they're migrating south or to a warmer climate to over winter, um, they'll meet up with uh, a male bat or females and males will meet up and they'll copulate and then that will be it. Then, they're go then they'll go into their dormancy period. Now, that egg isn't fertilized until the spring. So it just, um, it's called delay fertilization. It just stays in the female's body for months while it's hibernating. And then when that female wakes up and is ready to, uh, to migrate back um, north to uh, feed in the summertime, um, then a lot of the times those females are pregnant while migrating and they can migrate hun uh, hundreds to thousands of miles in a migration. So you can see how much energy input that might take as uh, these bats are migrating, which I find very interesting. Also, Another thing is when bats give birth, they actually have, I wish I had a better picture. Um, so right here, and I'll show you a picture of this in a few slides, but the tail is connected, just like the wings have like a skin flap, like a membrane, um, bats' tails also have a membrane around it as well. So sometimes females 
when they have their babies, they'll catch their babies when they have them in their um, little tail. Uh, it's called a Europatagium, and so they don't fall. So it's actually a really cool um, way to give birth. So um, the silver-haired bat is, um, I think, a, a really unique looking bat, and they don't like to always hang out in colonies. So a lot of bats like to hang out in large groups, but our silver-haired bat will hang out just in the bark of Ponderosa or Jeffrey Pines alone. So I think that to be, I think that's a very cool um, fact about them too. So here's another myth versus truth where I needed people's voting. So either thumbs up or thumbs down for false, thumbs up for truth. Bats are blind. So who can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Wendy thinks it's uh, false. False. It's a lot of false. A lot of false. Great. Oh, so the term or uh, the coin blind as a bat doesn't necessarily uh, make sense because um, bats, it just depends on the species, but some bats can see just as well as humans can but we're not going around echolocating and trying to find very tiny insects or moths in the middle of the night and having to find about a thousand of those in one night. So they have used a different way to see, which is echolocating, producing sounds. And again, I'll get into that in a little bit, um, but it's a good way to, a very efficient way for bats to find food. Now, some bats do have poor vision, uh, not, aren't necessarily blind, but some bats can see color at night and some bats are colorblind. So it really just depends on the species that we're talking about. But most bats are not blind. Sarah, do you have time for a question real quick? Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, perfect. Okay. So um, Acadia, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, asks, how long do bats stay with their babies once they give birth? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so um, they'll stay, so they'll have their babies in the summer and they'll, they'll depends on the species, but bats can last a, and a while and will migrate with their families or colonies back in the, in the fall. Um, but they, so baby bats will hang on to their mom, their moms or mothers for weeks. And it depends on the species, sometimes months. And another interesting thing is Bats have a really great sense of smell. So in large colonies, like um, Mexican free-tailed bats, they'll have like millions and millions of bats in one area. And all the females will kind of hide, hide the babies in, in a specific area and call that, science call, scientists call that a nursery. And um, when bats go out to feed, if they don't bring their babies with them, they'll come back into the, um, come back to, from, from outside feeding back to the nursery and they'll be able to find their babies, even, even if the babies are among thousands of other babies, based on their smell and also the sound that the baby and the mom makes. So um, I think that's really interesting. And a baby bat is called a pup. Bats will stay with their mom for a couple months. And here's a pallid bat. This is a, one of my other favorite bats that live in the Tahoe region. Um, the pallid bat is named after the uh, Latin, so or in Latin, light, pallid, it's very similar. So it has a light colored fur. But what I find very interesting about pallid bats is they don't just catch insects in the air. They'll actually scoop down to the ground and eat scorpions and centipedes and millipedes and grasshoppers that are on, on the forest or ground floor. Um, so we do have a couple different species of scorpions in Tahoe. I've seen them myself. They're sand scorpions and I've seen them out uh, by Mount Rose. And these pallid bats are the ones that eat those. So I think that's um, kind of nice to have uh, bats eating those critters. And they're also um, immune to scorpion venom. So if they do get um, uh, poked by a scorpion, it doesn't really affect that bat. Um, but if you also see on this pallid bat, their um, ears are tall, kind of similar to the Townsend's figured bat. And um, they have such great hearing that they can hear insect steps on the ground. So that's a way that they're able to detect their food. So I'm going to cover echolocation a little bit more because it is a little bit confusing. How I like to define echolocation is if you had a bouncy ball and you threw it at a wall, and it bounced back, you know how far, how hard you have to throw it next um, to be able to retrieve that bouncy ball. 
So echolocation is when, it, and when a bat produces a sound and those sound waves go until they hit something or not hit something. And if they do hit something, that sound waves travels back and they can hear it. So they can hear it at a high, way higher frequency than humans can. And I actually have some bat echolocation um, of local species we have. So here's um, the little brown bat, if you can listen up. So you hear like a chip, chip, like a, a high pitched chirp. And then you hear all these like lower, like noises. And what's happening is the bat is looking for an initial insect to eat. It'll go chirp, chirp, chirp. And when it hits an insect, it bounces back and they'll use lower clicks to get to that insect and capture it. And again, bats can eat up to a thousand or even more insects in one night. And a lot of bats can eat over their body or over half their body weight in one night as well. So if we were to do that, we'd probably be eating a lot, a lot of like hamburgers and stuff like that. But these bats, their metabolism is so fast, they need to eat as many insects as possible. So I'm gonna share the big brown bat and the Townsend's big eared bat. And I really want you to listen carefully and see the differences that you hear. And then here's Townsend's. Can you hear the, uh, raise your thumbs up if you can hear a difference in the sounds that the bats are making. Perfect, yeah, so the one's maybe a higher sound or a higher pitch sound and has like some weird uh, like drumming at the end. Um, I actually looked into non-local uh, bat sounds, and some bats actually sound like they're like rapping. Um, so if you're ever really bored, especially during quarantine, you can look at echolocation noises that bats make. But that's a little description of how bats echolocate. Um, does anybody have any questions? There are a few. So Nancy asks, um, what should she do if she finds an injured bat nearby? I have an answer to that in a, uh, in a little bit. Okay. And then Acadia again asks, um, can a bat see the fluorescence in a scorpion or is, do they only go by echolocation? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if they have also have um, heat sensors that they, or ways that they can see thermal. Uh, I know that vampire bats do, but I'm, I am pretty sure that bats just, uh, or pallid bats use solely echolocation to find their food, but I don't have a definite answer for that. But my assumption would be, it would be um, through echolocation. Any other questions? One more just came up. Um, this is from Wendy. Um, what is the best place to put a bat box? That's a great question How too. How high up near it? it? Should it be close to the house, far away? That's a great question, and that's uh, towards the end of the presentation. But long story short, it's nice to have wood or a pole standing alone because I've looked into a lot of bat box boxes, and um, you want to have it standing alone, pretty high up so predators can't access that bat box. Um, and then you also want it facing the sun so bats can warm themselves. Um, and then, because um, they rely on keeping warm, especially at nighttime, especially in Tahoe. Um, and then you want it a little bit farther from a tree. Some people put bat boxes on trees, but those can be disturbed by predators. But if you were to have it on a pole and then have a cedar bat box, which is one of the best ones, because um, they don't rot as easily, then uh, it would be uh, better to keep it away from predators. And as high up as, as a pole you can get probably 15 feet, 10 to 15 feet would be good. All right, so what I, what I was looking into today was um, response of echolocation in insects. And I was looking at this, um, this researcher that lives in Africa and he was studying moth and bat relationships. And when bats echolocate um, they, and they um, produce sounds that 
hit specific moths. Some moths will also produce noises that detour that echolocation and push it elsewhere. So I kind of envision like Star Wars fighting um, and then there's like the energy force and the energy force and it kind of goes to a different direction, which I find was very interesting. And then also um, a lot of butterflies, for example, the monarch will have bright colors that say, don't eat me, I don't taste good, or some, or I'm poisonous. Um, there are moths that also don't taste good and or are poisonous. So um, they will produce a specific noise as well as they rub their thorax together, these insects do. And um, uh, they'll produce this noise and the bats will avoid that specific insect. Now, thinking about that, there's also other moths that don't taste bad and are vulnerable to being eaten. So they copy other moths that um, make those noises, hoping to blend in and not be eaten by bats, which works for some animals. So um, there, bat, uh, moths do have defense. They're fuzzy, they're furry, and sound can travel over them, and they have a really quiet wing feet, but um, they are a primary food source for bats. Move on to our next slide, which is the little brown bat. Little brown bats are super cute. I love this picture of this little brown bat. And uh, typical little brown bats will live on average um, six and a half years, but there was one that was um, found that was um, 34 years old that lived in the wild. And again, there's so much to learn about bats. So all these facts that I'm saying now, once there's more research, I'm curious to see how even longer these bats can live. Um, and this little brown bat can consume up to a thousand insects also in one hour, which is really, really um, a lot of food. Um, and what's interesting about bats too is that their body temperature can fluctuate. When they're in, some bats, when they're in their dormancy or their hibernation stage, also called torpor, their body temperature can be as low as 34 degrees Fahrenheit. And once they're out of hibernation, out of that dormancy period, flying around looking for a thousand insects in one night, their temperature can be as much as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So that fluctuates a lot, as well as their heart rate and everything. Um, so that might be one of the reasons why they do live so long, so that they can shut their heart rate down or slow their heart rate down and reduce their body temperature so much, which might be a key into why they live uh, as long as they do. Um, but I did want to mention uh, white nose syndrome, which is one of the bigger issues that bats have. Basically, has it, well, let me ask, has, has anybody heard of white nose syndrome before? Okay, so um, white nose syndrome is a fungi that is, um, that is really harming a lot of uh, bat population in the U.S. and around, um, around it, the world, potentially. Um, and what happens is bats really need, when they're going to their dormancy and into their hibernation, they need to rest. Because when an animal goes into a dormancy, that's the strategy of that animal saving energy. So what happens is white nose syndrome, which is a fungi, goes around their skin, makes them itchy, goes around their muzzle and their nose, and it irritates them. So, um, you know, 100 or so days into hibernation or dormancy, and that fungi irritates them so much that it wakes them up out of their deep, deep sleep making it so that that bat is using two times the normal em energy than it would normally take during its hibernation and eventually it just starves that bat unfortunately and so white nose syndrome is a huge issue in the u.s and is really wiping out a lot of populations in the east and in the south and um, has made its way over to the west coast as well so there's a lot of research on bats that are um, experiencing white nose syndrome um, but there is some silver lining, if there is some silver lining. There are some bats that are more resistant to white nose syndrome, and um, those bats typically are able to retain a lot more fat and also have lower temperatures than other bats in that colony um, uh, while they're in their uh, dorm dormancy period. So um, it's something that scientists are heavily working on. So if you go to uh, explore caves as a in recreation or you go to Kentucky and you go to the Mammoth Caves National Park, you'll see a lot of wash stations where before and after you need to wash your shoes, you need to wash your hands and everything to make it so that these bats, this, this fungi isn't traveled across the states on somebody's hiking boot and put into a different cave and affecting bat populations in a different area. 
that's one of the issues that are making it so bad populations are declining. And I guess one thing I did forget when I was talking about fertilization and reproduction in bats is bats typically have one or two pups a year. So that's a very slow reproduction rate for how small of an animal it is. Whereas rabbits or mice, um, they can have up to 30 or more um, uh, animal, uh, babies a year. Bats can only have one or two. So if there's a hit on a, on a population of bat or if there's a vast decline, then it really does affect populations as it takes a while for them to, to reproduce because they, they're very slow. We're getting to one of the last few bats. Here's our uh, Yuma bat uh, or Yuma myotis, which is also the genus of this bat. And is our one of our smallest um, bats in, in Lake Tahoe. And I told you I'd show you that Europatagium, that skin flap right here. So um, that's how some bats catch food and also can catch their babies when they have them. Has anybody seen bats in the Tahoe region or down in Carson or Reno? Well, I'm sure they're going to be coming out here pretty soon if they aren't there already. You want to make sure that you see them at dawn or dusk at crepuscular hours or at nocturnal hours, which is at night. So this bat is also a really cool looking bat. Some people call it the lion bat because it looks like it has a big mane. This is actually called the hoary bat. And the hoary bat is one of the best bat migrators that we have in the United States. And they're, they're distributed um, all over the U.S. Um, and into South America and then up into Northeast Canada. So they're all over the place and they're very widely dispersed. Um, they also, when they're not breeding, they like to hang out by themselves and they can hibernate in areas or um, go through their torpor dormancy in areas um, that are very, very cold. So a lot of bats will leave, but hoary bats can actually um, stay in colder areas to hibernate. Um, but what I think is very interesting is the state of Hawaii has a type of hoary bat. And scientists are predicting that a hoary bat, uh, they migrated to Hawaii a thousand years ago and 10,000 years ago. And so there is now that its own species of hoary bat that lives on the islands and um, is the only native um, endemic bat uh, animal, or, oh, sorry, let re me rephrase that. It's the only endemic and native mammal that is terrestrial, meaning it solely lives on land um, on the whole island. So that's pretty cool to, to see um, that a bat was able to make it that far in a long migration. Any other questions? Um, we'll get into Mexican free tail bats. So who's ever been to some of the bridges in Reno to watch the bats fly out at night? Um, some yes, some no. Okay, cool. Well, there are some um, some of the bigger bridges that fly over the river. If you wait around at, again, crepuscular hours, so dawn and dusk, or mostly right after the sun sets, so you can see a bunch of bats fly out. And those bats are most likely the Mexican free-tailed bat pictured in this image. So here's a, here's a, a bridge in Austin, Texas, where all the bats come out from underneath the bridge right before uh, the, or right as the sun's setting and people and viewers go to watch them because it's a really cool sight. Well, Mexican free-tailed bats, if you look at this cave right here, every little reddish dot that you can see and even the white dot, there's a bat in there. And this cave called the Bracken Cave near San Antonio, Texas, Ho um, host 200 million bats in just one cave. So they are colony, uh, colony, um, very social mammals, and they hang out in large groups. And when it's time for the sun to set, they'll fly out and they'll go and eat tons of insects and literally 250 tons of insects in one night, this colony of bats can eat. So one cave of bats, can eat 250 tons of insects in one night. So not only are in, uh, bats pollinators, but they're also insect insectivores, meaning that they consume a lot of insects that can be harmful to agriculture and plants growing in the US. And so if we didn't have bats, we wouldn't have all the plants that we have growing um, in these areas. So something to remember is that pesticides, are very harmful for bat populations because it harms or it kills the insects as an insecticide and then the bats don't have as much food to feed on. 
So it's best to, uh, to eat foods that don't have um, all the pesticides that kill the insects. So we're gonna dive into some local bat research where I've contacted a few specific bat biologists. And um, there is a lot of information that needs to be learned about bats. They're um, very understudied, like I said earlier, but there is a little bit more, um, there's more of a push to understand bats because they are so unique and they can be potentially threatened. I mean, a third of all bats are on their way to being endangered if they're not already endangered. So in order to collect information about bats, scientists put up these really, really tall nets called mist nets. And mist nets um, are also the same nets that um, catch birds. When we, when we ban birds here at the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, we use the same type of net, but a lot shorter because it doesn't have to be as tall. So imagine like a, a lunch lady's uh, hair net that's very, very big, uh, 20 feet high in some cases and long and over like a river or an area where a bat would be flying. So when um, every single time a bat is, is caught and tangled in a mist net, it, has, it gets a band put on it, so it gets the name, and then they check if it is pregnant or if this bat has, has a baby or if this bat has contract, uh, contracted um, white nose syndrome. So it is important to conduct bat research through, via mist nets. But it also is very, very time and uh, a, lot of, a lot of money towards this research because every single bat that's banded in a mist net, once it, all the tools that have uh, been used to take the information have to be cleaned thoroughly because again white nose syndrome is so impactful on large colonies that bats have to um uh the scientists have to clean where where the that bat was so again that's why i put the lysol um uh, logo right here but here in this uh in this graph it shows the different species of bats and which ones were caught and the abundance of them a little bit more fun <laughs> information is uh, bats also um, can be detected based on the sound. So if you remember earlier in the presentation when we heard like the echolocation, the clicking, the, and the chirping of the, of the bats, they all sounded a little bit different. Well, that's really important because they have these detectors that are basically um, large poles that are sent up into the sky and these acoustic back detectors can hear what the echolocation sounds sound like and they can prescribe what bat made that noise. So if that bat isn't caught in a mist net, then it probably could be caught acoustically. Using acoustics help scientists determine which species are there that aren't caught in the net. And it's also less invasive and it doesn't um, uh, interrupt that bat's feeding. And also since bats are sensitive, it doesn't interrupt their stress levels as much. So um, this is our last scary looking graph. I know I try to put as, minimal um, graphs on my presentations, but this capture rate is what was found in mist nets in the 2014 bat study. And this um, row is the bat that were detected via just the sound. So you can see how much more successful it is to figure out how many species are there, but the capture rate tells how many individuals per species. I do have a true or false, remember true or false with a, uh, a down sign. Um, please participate. Uh, bats are dirty and many carry rabies. Thank you. True, thumbs up, medium, maybe both, you don't know, or down is uh, false. Here's how I like to put it. Bats do have diseases. They, they are mammals and they can host viruses. They can have rabies, which is a disease that no one wants. Um, it, it's very fatal. They can um, contract coronaviruses. They can contract, um, I've read some research about measles and mumps and a bunch of other things. However, when we're talking about rabies, there's the same chance that a squirrel on the top of Mount Tillac or a squirrel in your backyard has rabies has rabies is the same um, percentage that a bat that you find has rabies. It's less than 1% and it's not common at all in bats. However, it does occur. So if you do encounter any sort of mammal outside, don't touch the mammal with your hands. You don't want to get 
any sort of uh, diseases from mammals. You want to make sure you have a safe distance from anything that you find outside. So that's, if, just don't touch mammals because any mammal can have diseases, including plague. Um, uh, there's a lot of the times where rodents are tested for plague in Tahoe recreation areas every single year. So what happens if you have a bat in your home? Number one, don't panic, okay? So don't freak out, don't try to kill it or anything like that. What you wanna do is you want to make sure that it gets outside. So if it's flying around, it flew in, you're like, you didn't shut your screen door fully, it gets in there and you open the screen door and it flies back out, probably fine. However, if there's a bat that's acting very odd, maybe came in in the daytime, had odd behavior, you wanna make sure to call someone and have that person um, take that out of your house. So um, Nevada Department of Wildlife does so. There's a few different uh, organizations or um, pest controls that will come in and get the bats out for you. But again, you do not wanna touch any sort of mammal with your bare hands because there is the possibility of contracting disease. However, you, it's very rare and a lot of people scapegoat bats as being like, the disease carrier and spreading it all over, but really it's every mammal has that potential of, of, of giving that to humans. I just wanna say that bats are a lot of the time named as the bad guy and we wanna make sure that they're super important to understand that they're very important for our ecosystem. If we didn't have bats, we wouldn't have the plants that we have, we wouldn't have, it wouldn't work. The, the world wouldn't work. So they're not the bad guys, they're actually very important. They eat insects again, pollinate, and remember, you like your margaritas and so on. Um, so we shouldn't, we should definitely um, uh, help uh, with conservation in bats, especially in the Tara region too. So how can you help bats? You can spread the word of maybe some things that you learned today, some interesting facts, and maybe help people grow their hearts towards bats. Um, additionally, re reduce pesticide uh, use, like I said earlier, with planes spraying pesticides over plants best to try to consume foods without pesticides for your health benefits as well. Um, you could put up a bat house, like I said earlier. Uh, cedar bat houses are sold. You can find them all over um, Amazon. You can order them. You can make them yourself. There's a lot of different diagrams where you can make them yourself. Um, you can put them against a, a tree if you don't have any other area to put a pole, but a lot of the times the best way to, to help bats is using a pole and then having a bat box high up about 15 feet high. Um, you can really be at uh, pay attention to avoid areas where if a bat's hibernating to not go into that area and disturb it. So caving in the in winter time or hibernation time is probably not the best idea. There's that potential there. Um, you can help collect data. So there's uh, we're trying to get um, with a bunch of different governmental entities like Forest Service and State Parks to go and start conducting acoustic bat monitoring around the lake. So that's something that we're, we're trying to get started. Um, and there's so many other things that you can find online to help um, with that conservation, um, including donations and so on. So um, I'm gonna give you a couple more examples of how you can get involved with just animals in general and the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science where I work. And then I'll open it to questions about bats or anything science related. Um, so at the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, where I work, um, we research and we teach people a lot about the local animals in the area. And if you want, you can join us for an outing. Again, I have a bird tour at 7.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, we're doing social distancing with masks, bird tours, up to eight people per tour, and we'll be spaced apart. Um, and all these tours that we do and all of our programs are free. So you don't have to worry about having to pay a fee or anything like that. Uh, to participate with our, our, our information and our tours. Um, again, you can help with citizen science. Um, we do a Christmas bird count every year. We collect bald eagle information. Um, if you have any questions about that, th our website has a lot of information or you can email me personally, which is the next slide. Um, for $35 a year, especially right now with the COVID impacts, you can become a member of TINS. Um, and that basically supports all of our free programming and our programming oriented towards kids, um, which is, uh, I find to be very, very valuable. There's a lot of kids that don't even know what a Stellar Shea is in their backyard, or they might not even know what a Jeffrey Pine is. And if you, there's a lot higher of a stewardship rate if you understand what is in your backyard. 
So uh, $35 a year can really help support us. Um, I just put together a, uh, every day in June, something to look for out in nature, whether it's five species of birds. We have a whole entire, you can just download and print the one sheet, put it on your fridge, and it's a, it's a nature scavenger hunt that you can do for the whole month of June. So if you want that information, you can email me and I'll send you that, that link. You can also find it on our website very easily. Um, you can volunteer with us um, and help be a docent for the Todd Institute for Natural Science. And I guess most importantly um, is just spread the, the word about us because um, we're, we're doing a lot of good work. I'm going to get off my presentation so people can unmute themselves and um, we can open this to discussion. All right. Do you think bats can detect the mist nets through echolocation so they can avoid them by Barbara? Uh, yes. So it isn't the most efficient way to catch bats. They can recognize even the smallest little tiny strands of thread. However, if it's, there's the occasion where they, it, it, the echolocation does hit or they're flying you know, diagonally and they don't uh, hit that area. Good question, Barbara. Um, how fast can bats fly? That's a really great question, and that depends on the species. I saw some species can fly up to 14 miles per hour, but some bats if, uh, were recorded at 40 miles per hour, so it can fluctuate um, with speed. When is it bat season in Reno and Tahoe? Great question, Bob. Um, bat season is the summertime, so they should be here, um, and I guess the, the best question is when to see them right now is uh, crepuscular hours and nocturnal hours um, and near a water area. So if there's like a river or a lake or a stream nearby, then that's a really good time to see bats. Um, but June, July and August and September are all good months where you can, you can see bats. Obviously the, the hottest parts of June and July, or sorry, July and August are, are great times to see bats as well. Question from Facebook. Um, can they di differentiate individuals of the same species using a sound differentiation method or just know if a species was present or not? Um, yes, so bats can, um, so the vocalizations or the echolocation clicks and sounds can be, can be detected and that is what is used. So I've personally seen the acoustic bound uh, bat detectors and a lot of the times it will detect a, a bat's sound echolocating noise. And then it will give you, if it's a weak noise, they'll be like, it's either this bat, this bat, or this bat. But a lot of the times it can identify right there what species it is based on um, the sound method. Um, how long do bats sleep? That's a really great question. Um, bats will sleep during the daytime and it really depends on the species. Bats will also sleep in their dormancy period for 120 days sometimes. Some bats will hibernate for 18 days, so they'll sleep 18 days at a time, wake up, maybe go, if it's a little bit warmer, have some food and go back to sleep. There's all different types of sleep patterns with bats, depending on the species, the region they are, and the individual. Um, but they do, I guess the best question is, um, in the daytime, bats a lot of times will sleep, and at nighttime, they'll be active. So they can sleep up to 15 hours. Um, do bats not like different bat species? That's a really good question. And it's something I don't quite know. Um, I haven't looked into that at all. But um, I think as long as there's enough food availability, then I would assume that bats are able to coexist. Um, I personally haven't seen bats fight. Um, but they can be ter territorial within their own colonies. For example, the flying fox bat, which is one of the largest bats that we have on the planet, they'll fight with each other over the best branch. So I'm assuming there are fights in the animal kingdom along within species and with, um, uh, with different species, but um, they're probably, they probably keep to themselves a lot as well. Perfect. Those are a lot of questions. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I think we'll- Johnson has a question if we want to- Is unmute there one her. more? Right here. Let's see if we can unmute Johnson. There's a kid question raising their hand. So- I've seen a bat before. 
Wow, you're super, you're super and lucky. And Nanny Lily and Papa's barn. Wow, that's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, it's really awesome to see a bat because they're, a bat because It was hanging so on cool. the wall and it was so black and that I couldn't really see it so well. Makes sense. Great observation. What about Jade and June before we sign off? Um, what if they eat the bugs that were poisoned? Well, I was, that's a good question. I did look into that. And if a bat, does, if, or sorry, if a moth doesn't taste good, they're not going to eat it. They'll taste it and spit it out. Like, oh, just like if you don't like a food and you were to eat it, you'd probably be like, yuck, and probably spit it out, or spit it into a napkin. Um, I bats do the same thing. Great question, Jade and June. Um, what if the bats like slept on the ground near a rock? A rat snake could be on the rock, like kind of flushed. What if bite the bats? Um, there are predators of bats. Lots of birds, snakes, hawks, bats eat eat bats all around the all around the world. And some bats actually can eat other bats, which is kind of scary. But um, not in Tahoe, but in other in other countries. Um, if a rattlesnake found a bat, probably would eat it because that'd probably be a really tasty treat. But luckily, bats don't like to hang out too much on the ground, and they like to be high up in roosts. So it probably wouldn't be. It would probably really be hard for those bats to be eaten by a rattlesnake. What about what about cobras? They go in trees. I'm sure a cobra would really like to eat a bat, but they're not here in Taos, so I don't know too much about them. But there are snakes that are big predators of bats. So that's really good thinking and putting two and two together to see maybe a predator that would eat a bat. So great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your evening with us and all the information about bats. I found it fascinating. Thank you. And thank you everyone else for joining us. Um, if you want more information on uh, library events, you can visit our website. And we also just kicked off our summer reading program on June 1st. So there's a lot of information about our summer reading program on the website. So sign up for that, earn free books, and um, keep up your summer reading. All right, I'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you guys, everyone, um, for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.